Hi, everyone. Eric here. Very quickly before we get to our discussion today with Professor Danny Bradlow, I just want to remind you that if you're interested in following the China-Africa story more closely, everything from the politics of debt relief to what's going on with COVID-19 to the events that happened in Guangzhou, you'll definitely find our daily email newsletter to be of interest. And because you, our podcast listeners, have been so loyal to us over the years, we wanted to come up with a way to say thank you. And so we've discounted the annual subscription fee by a third to just $99. Go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code podcast at checkout. And of course, if you're a student or a teacher, it's still always half off. Once again, that's ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa-China Reporting Project at Witt University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa-China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from sub-China. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Kobus, we're going to come back to the debt issue only because, well, that is really one of the biggest stories of the moment right now. And we're trying to explore the debt issue in Africa from lots of different sides. Now, the Chinese are a key player, but they are not the only player. Let's talk about this in, in a bigger picture. According to the most recent World Bank data, Africans owe about half a trillion dollars, $493 billion to be precise, in long-term debt to foreign uh, creditors of all kinds. Now, let's break that down a little bit. About a third of that is owed to China. We think the number somewhere around $150, $154 billion dollars. Another third of that, and again, these are flexible numbers, to various multilateral lenders like the World Bank, the IMF, the so-called Paris Club lenders. And then, of course, there's the last third that's owed to private creditors like bondholders. Estimates put that at around $117 billion. Now, you'll recall from a previous show we did where we spoke with Charlie Robertson, the chief global economist from Renaissance Capital, about that private debt. And if you missed that episode, I highly recommend you go and check it out because he gives a very distinct viewpoint from the city, from Wall Street, from private creditors. But one thing we didn't talk about with Charlie is the role of so-called vulture funds. Now, these guys can be a nasty bunch. What they do is when a country like the DRC, Zambia, Uganda can't repay its debts, the owner of that debt, which might be a pension fund or an asset management firm, figures, you know what, I'm probably going to lose everything anyway, so I might as well sell this debt to someone else, even if it's at, say, 25, 30 cents on the dollar for a loss. And it's those people who buy that debt at a discount who become the vultures because they go back to those governments. And not only do they say, you have to pay us back in full, but if you don't, we're going to sue you. And then they even make even more money. So these vulture funds are very aggressive. They're not just in Africa. Uh, they were present uh, here in Asia after the 98 crisis. They're present in the United States where they buy up distressed assets. They are very much a part of of the current economic system, uh, and they are circling overhead right now, as vultures do in Africa. And Kobus, it's interesting here because so much of the discussion today about debt in Africa and the debt crisis focuses on what are the Chinese going to do? And I've been trying to get into these discussions on social media and Twitter to say, folks, I don't think you have to worry about the Chinese as much as you have to worry about these private creditors and the vultures. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, kind of the and, and this has been, you know, one of the reasons why I think we need to discuss also, you know, in this conversation, the the um, initiative by the G20 to, you know, to to put a blanket freeze on, on, on repayments, you know, along, you know, you know, with with certain kind of strings attached, um, and because 
you know, so so much, so many of these initiatives focus on on big players like like China, like other big bilateral lenders and and uh, multilateral institutions. But but in a lot of cases, they leave these private creditors and vulture funds and other players off the table. And you know, kind of, it, it's really important to to discuss the entire debt landscape with everyone involved. Well, we're going to do this over a period of weeks and months to look at that entire debt landscape. And today, we're going to be focusing on these vulture funds and maybe what a solution for Africa could be. Although today's show isn't directly focused on China's role, it's all part of that bigger conversation. And you really can't understand one part without understanding the other. So that's why we think this is good as a jigsaw piece to kind of put together. And we're thrilled to have on the program for the first time Danny Bradlow, who's the Sarchi Professor of International Development Law and African Economic Relations at the University of Pretoria. Danny's been writing a lot about this uh, lately. In just the past month, two very interesting articles came out. Uh, one is in the conversation uh, called Vultures, Doves, and African Debt, Here's a Way Out. The other one, Deterring the Debt Vultures in Africa, that was published in Project Syndicate. We'll have links to that later. But first, Danny, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So you were critical of our discussion that we had with Charlie Robertson because we didn't focus on vulture funds. Uh, let's just start our discussion saying, what exactly is the risk in Africa as you see it and what we missed in our discussion with Charlie? Well, I think there, there are two things. One is the risk of the vulture funds. And I think you gave a very good description of what the vulture funds are in the beginning. Um, one of the things to know about the vulture funds is that they, they, they're not very transparent. I mean, they're speculators who are trying to buy up things at the biggest possible discount so that they can get the biggest possible returns. And so it's always hard to know exactly how big the vulture funds are. But they, they're working with um, investment firms that are the bondholders who, as you say, reach a point where they say, you know, it's easier for us to sell out now than to stay involved, even though we're going to take a loss. So that's the one concern. The other concern, which is not unique to the vulture funds, but to all the bondholders, is do they have a sense of what their responsibilities are as investors in Africa or in any uh, debt that they buy? Because they issue the bonds to sovereign debtors, the risks involved in those bonds. Um, they ex assume those risks in issuing those bonds. Uh, many of them have signed up to principles such as the principles on responsible investing, which say they should be applying standards of environmental and social responsibility in their, in their uh, investment decisions and in the way they manage their investments. And then there's the, the, uh, a crisis like the corona crisis hits um, Africa, which is outside everybody's control. And the investors should not be pushing all the risk of that onto the credit, onto, excuse me, onto the debtor countries. They have to share some of that risk and to come up with mechanisms that are fair to everyone, so that the burden of this crisis is shared more evenly. And that that's not asking them to do anything charitable. It's asking them to live up to the principles that they agreed to when they signed up to the principles on responsible investing or many of them have their own environmental, social, and in some cases, human rights policies that would tell them that they need to live up to, to certain standards in their activities. So what do the work of these funds look like on the ground? Like what, what are some examples of, of kind of bad influences they've had in countries in Africa or equivalent countries around the world? So in, in Africa in particular, they first became an issue during the, the so-called HIPIC initiative, the high, highly indebted poor countries initiative in the 1990s, when um, official creditors were saying they would help African countries, which then had very high debt levels, reduce their debt to more manageable levels and allow them to use that money for sustainable development. Um, and at that point, a relatively small portion of Africa's debt was owed to private creditors. It was about 17% of the total. Um, and no, at the time, everyone thought, well, if the, uh, if the official creditors give debt relief, that will be enough to help the African countries get back on their feet and to reduce their debt levels. And it did. It reduced it from about 100% of GDP to about 30% of GDP by the end of that process. But 
Um, what happened in Zambia is a good example. So Zambian debt, some of it was bought by a hedge fund or an investment fund. At, um, at four, so there was $50 million worth of the debt that was bought for about $5 million. Um, the, and as Eric said at the beginning, they, the, those creditors then went to the Zambian government and said, you owe us $50 million. And a, as a legal matter, that was correct. But um, the Zambia, they then sued the Zambian government in English courts and eventually were able to collect 15 million. So they made over 300% profit on, a, on that transaction. And so that gave, gives you a sense. I mean, they can make up to 2,000% profit on this. It's, they've done this in African countries over the last 20 or so years, about 15 different countries. Um, and most of those countries have, in the end, had to settle by paying some of that at least. So, that, so they usually don't have to pay 100%, but as the Zambian example uh, explains, they do have to pay a fair amount of, of what they owe. Now, you use words like should, responsibility, burden sharing, and I guess you know those are not words that I associate with global capitalism. Those are words that, that do not usually come into... I mean, again, I'm an American... And as an American, we are raised in a much more brutal form of capitalism than I think other parts of the world. We are accustomed to, again, things that I think Europeans and others would find objectionable in many ways. And, and so it's a little bit odd for me because who is going to enforce that fairness you're talking about? Because from what I can see, it's purely voluntary. You're asking the companies who have made right. those commitments. Walmart makes a lot of promises that it doesn't live up to. Lots of companies do that on ethical sourcing, lots of different things. That's just in part part of their marketing and their brand positioning. But they don't actually mean it if it's going to compromise their bottom line. So I'm wondering about these ideals that you're putting forward and the reality of that actually happening. Okay, so I, I mean, you raise a good point. There's no legal requirement that you could enforce that says they must do that and they can be held legally liable if they don't. However, over the last 10, 15 years, um, m most uh, financial institutions have been moving to being, say, to saying they're going to be much more responsible in terms of their lending activity. Uh, you might recall last year the U.S. Business Roundtable, for example, which represents the biggest corporations in the world and is chaired at the moment by Jamie Dimon, the, the J.P. Morgan um, CEO, said that companies should, should not focus primarily on their, the value, uh, producing value for their shareholders, but they should focus on all their stakeholders and delivering value for all stakeholders. Um, BlackRock, the CEO of BlackRock, has said something similar. More and more companies are saying that it's in their best interest to focus on environmental, social, and governance issues in making their investment decisions. So there's a, a shift going on in realizing, partially because of climate change, partially because of changing political dimension, uh, uh, dynamics, that... Um, it's no longer good business to just be driven by short-term profit motivations. Yeah, but do you genuinely believe that? Because, I mean, again, I'm, I'm surprised only because during the pandemic, CNBC is reporting that American billionaires became $434 billion richer. Jeff Bezos himself became $34.6 billion richer. And, tw and Mark Zuckerberg, $25 billion. Who manages all that money? but Jamie Dimon and BlackRock. I mean, these guys, I mean, the wealth has been floating up to the top. Part of the reason why we're seeing right. the unrest in the United States is that very inequality that these institutions have helped foster. So I've seen no indication beyond the rhetoric that they're actually going to do this, which makes me suspicious that they would do something like this in Africa as well, that they would actually live up to those ideals in Africa. I, look, I, there's lots of grounds for being cynical about this. I, I mean, I find it stunning that you can go look at JP Morgan, for example, and it has a human rights policy on its website. Easy to find. Very, when you read it, it's as good a human rights policy as I think many human rights lawyers or activists would want. But I don't think most of us would, agree that, would be confident that they're going to live up to that all the time. So I think there is grounds for cynicism. I think, though, um, we need to take them at their word. And if necessary, 
be calling their bluff and saying, you need to show us what you mean by this. I think point number one. Point number two is, and it, this is becoming clearer now um, during this crisis as well, is that it's becoming clear that companies that live up to responsible environmental, social, and governance standards actually have better um, profitability records and lower costs of capital. So there is a strong reason, um, financial and economic reason, for them to want to do this as well. I mean, if you put this specifically in the African context, we know that this crisis is as severe a crisis as there's been in the last 75 years, at least. I mean, just to give one indication, the IMF six months ago was expecting um, African countries to grow at about 3.5% for, for this year, 2020. In April, they said it would be a decline of 1.6%. And it's likely that when they next update this, it'll be even more of a, a contraction. So it's very unlikely that African countries can actually, at the moment, fully perform their obligations without making major sacrifices um, on, on, in terms of health and uh, uh, food and, and the welfare of their people. So it's in the, you'd have to say to these countries, to these creditors, what's more logical and more um, financially prudent to give these countries relief now so that they can use all the money that they need to, or that they can, to address the problems in their own countries. And then once the crisis has passed and they can begin developing again to begin um, meeting their debt obligations, is, is that better? Or do you really think if you squeeze them as hard now as, as the law allows you to do, and that you agreed with them not out of any malice, but out of what you thought the world was like a year ago or whenever the debt was incurred, um, and then expect them when the crisis is over and they've had to bear the burden of the crisis plus meeting their debts, that they will really be in a position to service their debts on the, according to their original terms. And it seems to me that the it's enlightened self-interest, really, to say, let's help them through the crisis, and then once it's over, we can think about what's the most uh, effective way to, to get the countries back on, into working order again, so to speak. What is the what is the institutional framework within which they operate? Uh, you know, who who are they regulated by, if anyone, and and who can African countries complain to in case there is you know kind of this kind of terrible situation like like a government being being held to hostage essentially? Uh, you mentioned that you know, that that fight that particular fight was was fought out in in British courts. So is it really a situation where where you know kind of where London essentially decides the fate of? of uh, an entire African country? I mean, only if it actually gets to court. The, the, part of the problem is there is no real institutional framework. I mean, if we were talking about companies, we would be saying, you know, you, the company could go into some form of bankruptcy and then there's a legal procedure involving a court that would make a decision and that would enforce some sort of an agreement on everyone. There is no similar arrangement for dealing with sovereign debtors. Um, so that the, there's no framework that can make this anything other than a voluntary process. The regulate, the, all the bond holders, to the extent that they're institutional actors, would be subject to some regulation in their own countries. But those, you know, I mean, that could mean many different countries because there are going to be hundreds of different bond holding institutions and they each would be in different countries. Um, and they might, each one country would have slightly different regulations. It might be even within one country that you're dealing with different sorts of institutions so that they have different types of regulators as well. Um, each of the bonds would have different legal terms and conditions so that you know, it's, it becomes a very complicated process. And in a way, either you have to get agreement from everyone, uh, or at least a critical mass of them, which is very difficult, which is why I've said in, a, in my idea of a, a, a Dove Fund, um, let's not even deal with that. Let's raise money that uh, essentially the Dove Fund becomes a responsible investor in the bonds of African countries. So it can buy the bonds without 
seeking permission from anyone. It just has to have the money to do that. And then it can deal with them in the way that it thinks is the most responsible. Now, you've mentioned Dove Funds, and uh, that's an acronym for Debts of Vulnerable Economies. That's a cute acronym, by the way. Uh, so that's, uh, it, and it just works really nicely, especially as a contrast to vultures. And it, it seems, if I understand this correctly, to be very similar to the idea that is being promoted by Vera Songwe and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, where they would kind of buy up all of the debt or, you know, round up all of the African debt and then have it purchased or collateralized in some way by a AAA or a high bond rating or high credit rating agency like a central bank or the African Development Bank or someone like that, and then resell that to investors under the better credit rating. So therefore, the actually underlying assets would be protected. And, uh, and so that's the general idea. Can you just tell us a little bit more about this Dove Fund and the debts of vulnerable economies and what it is and, and why you think that's a part of the solution? So it's not dissimilar from what um, the UNEC and Vera Songwe's organization is thinking. What it, it does that's different is it says it'll do three things. It says, look, the first requirement is Africa needs money. So you want to uh, a fund that will come in uh, and we, I'll, let me say, well, let me back up a second and say, how do we raise money for this fund? So I've said it should be raised from everybody in a sense. So it should be official governments, should uh, donor governments should contribute, um, and there are a number of ways that they could contribute, uh, which would reduce the burden on them, but it would give the money to the fund. The IMF, the World Bank, can contribute in various ways. Uh, financial institutions and individuals and foundations can contribute. So everybody contributes to this fund. The fund then buys the debt on the open market at whatever the discounted price of the debt is. And it commits in advance that it's going to live up to these soft law principles that, that we were talking about earlier. And it, then it says to the um, African debtors, you asked Africa as a through the African Union asked for a two year debt standstill to allow African countries to use their debt service payments um, to address the, the COVID crisis at the moment. We agree to allow you to do that. Um, we not only will we do that, we'll help you advocate to other creditors that they should agree to this as well. And as a third thing, we agree once the crisis is over. Um, that we will work with you to make sure that your debts are, you live up to your commitments, but you do it in a way that it's not an undue burden on your um, ability to, to restore a sense of sustainable development. Um, as, and in some ways, that's because the UNECA fund is just going to deal with the, the standstill now. It, hasn't, it isn't really thinking forward, and it certainly isn't saying, um, that it would apply these principles. The third, um, or the next step of my process would be that the fund would also advocate to other creditors that they should participate um, in this process as well on the same terms. And if it's big enough and influential enough, it, it becomes, it has a seat at the table as a negotiation, as when the negotiations begin and that it can then put these principles and try and push everyone to, to adopt a, a more socially and developmentally responsible approach to the debt. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa Channel Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at VitsChinaAfrica or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. What are the main obstacles that you see um, to implementing this kind of system as you're suggesting? Like, who, who are the, the stakeholders who might resist it the hardest? So the biggest obstacle is raising the funds. So it's getting... Um some foundations, some donor governments to raise the funds. Um, from the donor government point of view, one way that they could do that is um, for, as a legacy of the global financial crisis, they have SDRs, which are the special drawing rights, which are the IMF's um, created reserve asset, which they don't use. And they could donate that to this fund 
in various ways so that that money gets used for that. Um, that would be the, that's the biggest obstacle, really, because once the fund exists, um, then it has to buy the debt on an open market. And, I mean, the, the, these markets are not super liquid, so that uh, it's not always that easy to buy. But I think, given the situation, many, many investors would be interested in selling their debt. Um, and, and that would give... Once they start buying it, that also will raise the price of the debt, which is a, a disincentive for the for the vulture funds. Um, if the debt becomes, if the fund becomes big enough, so it's influential enough, then the it, it becomes a, a player and a voice within the discussions about what to do about Africa's uh, private debt. And then the the other stakeholders are the other private creditors. And that is an issue because there's so many of them and getting them all to participate is, is complicated. Um, but if you're a big enough voice, it makes them have to listen in some way to you. So I think that's um, the, 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 a potential obstacle. The third one, which is a, needs to be taken seriously, is that some African governments, so for example, the Kenyan Minister of Finance has said they don't want a debt standal, standstill. They want to show their creditors that they, they're going to pay their debts according to their original terms so that when the crisis is over, they have access to financial markets. And there's some nervousness amongst some African countries of, of a stigma of being branded as a defaulting debtor and that the cost of that could be higher to them than um, than agreeing to the standstill now. And so they might not want to be associated with a fund like this. And my response to that is twofold. One is it should be voluntary. So if a country says they don't want to participate, the fund should respect that. Um, and the second thing is, I've, for many countries, the access to the markets is going to be very difficult because many of them um, are going to find uh, many of them were debt stressed. They were in, in in difficult situations even before the COVID crisis, and some of those, are, for example, Zambia are going to have to renegotiate their debt and are going to incur are going to find access limited. And so, for those countries, this becomes a potentially um, benefit and something that they would support. And the fund can just focus on that group of countries. I'm wondering if, as you've been talking about this, if you seem discouraged now by seeing what's actually playing out in reality, that the IMF and the World Bank have called for a $100 billion fund to help Africa. Uh, that has not come about. Meantime, trillions of dollars have been approved by the U.S., European, in the Chinese and Japanese governments in lightning fast time. Uh, but yet $100 billion is too much. Uh, the G20 plan is meeting with lukewarm reception. Even Kenya turned it down. And so raising this money is actually a big thing. Now, on the SDRs, the special drawing rights, it's my understanding that you cannot just raise money for Africa. The special drawing rights in the IMF go for everybody. So there's, they, don't, they can't just portion out a, a part of the world that gets a, an expanded capital infusion from special drawing rights. So when they expand the special drawing rights, Iran will benefit, North Korea will benefit, China will benefit from it, China being the second largest shareholder in the IMF. And that's not something that's going to go down very well in Washington, where the Trump administration doesn't like any of those people. So I'm wondering about when this idea meets the reality of raising the money, and we're seeing right now, nothing's happening on that front. Does that undermine the whole premise of the Dove Fund, then, if you can't actually get started by raising the capital? There's no question that the first question is raising the capital. Just on the SDRs, though, it's important to distinguish. So in the financial crisis in 2008, the IMF um, issued $250 billion worth, more or less, of SDRs to countries according to their quotas. And as you said, so it goes to everyone um, pro rata. Um, so now that a lot of that 250, so for example, many of the European countries or the US received an allocation in, at that point, but they haven't actually used it. So it's sitting on their books as a reserve asset that they're not using. 
Um, but they could use that to contribute to a fund like this. That's different from if the IMF decides now to make a new um, allocation of SDRs, which would then go to the full membership. The U.S. has opposed that, of a new issue of SDRs, and is blocking that effectively from happening. But it doesn't have any say over whether, for example, Germany or China, for that matter, were to say, we're going to take a portion of our SDR allocation and allocate it um, to a fund to help African debt relief, so to do the Dove Fund or something like that. So, I, I mean, there is reason to be concerned, but I think it is possible to do this because I think you don't require the agreement of of all the creditors. So as long as we could raise enough money, then we would be able to implement this without anybody else being able to stop this fund. Moving our discussions um, slightly, um, I was wondering what you, um, how concerned you are about the chi the Chinese aspect of, of of all of this. Obviously, China is is, is a very large bilateral debtor for for Africa, and so far. We've heard very little coming out of Beijing about how exactly they're going to be dealing with this. Um, you know, in our newsletter today, we we covered you know that that uh, this uh, foreign ministry spokespeople were very vague um, about it. Um, you know, essentially saying, "Well, we you know we we're looking into it," kind of you know that that level of vagueness. Um, and um, and at the same time, the only the only kind of concrete thing we've heard so far is that they plan to to look at it on a case by case basis, which this made you know kind of many people in Africa. Um, um, you know, kind of, what is your view of how the Chinese portion of this issue fits into the wider landscape of, of the debt crisis? So, the two aspects to that, I guess. First is that there is a real concern amongst the creditors that there should be equal treatment of all creditors. So, if the donors, can't, if the official creditors give debt relief and the bondholders give debt relief, but China doesn't then there's a concern that all the benefits of that relief really goes to China rather than to being used for, for the benefit of COVID-related issues in developing countries. Um, China has agreed as part of the G20 to the debt standstill initiative that the G20 has um, promoted. Um, but I agree with you, there is a concern because, uh, as you pointed out, the Chinese debt accounts for roughly a third of the total African long-term external debt. Now, it's mainly, as I understand it, bank-based um, debt, and it, a lot of it's related to specific projects. So it is a particular category of debt. But if a third of the debt is not incorporated into the debt relief, that is a problem. Um, so... I, it, I think it is necessary that China participate for a debt initiative to really be meaningful. Um, I mean, I would suggest to the Chinese that one of the things they should do is have their banks commit to the principles that I'm suggesting for the Dove Fund um, or contribute, or China could contribute some money to a fund from their SDR allocations or their reserves to support a fund like this and to say, look, that helps um, we're doing that as a, a way of helping Africa de deal with this crisis. And that will help us in the long run because if um, Africa will be able to pay back the money that, for all the projects that we're, we're helping to fund. Um, but if, Af if China doesn't participate, dealing with the debt issue will become more and more complicated. Yeah, it seems like the Chinese are participating in one part with the G20 process in their limited role on multilateral debt, but on the bilateral debt, they're following what the private sector is doing. I think it's called the Africa Private Creditors Working Group. Uh, and they're going bilaterally, one by one, having their own negotiations behind closed doors and not cooperating with the others. That's that's my understanding of it. We don't actually know too much about what's going on. Um, I'd like to close our discussion just to kind of get a sense of, based on what you've seen now over the past two months, and I go, I say two months only because it was on March 23rd when Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, he issued a declaration ahead of the G20 summit, the virtual G20 summit, where he said that uh, African economies were facing an existential threat unless there was debt relief. It has been nine weeks now, and we have not seen much progress at all, uh, either on the bilateral, the private creditor, or on the multilateral side. 
I mean, maybe a lot of things are happening behind closed doors that we don't know about, which I presume, but at least publicly, not much has happened. Meantime, credit ratings are getting hit, uh, foreign exchange reserves are declining, inflation is going up, and the situation is deteriorating by the day. So based on the reality of today of what we know and what we're seeing and the fact that we don't think that the Chinese and the Americans are ever really going to collaborate nicely together at places like the UN or the IMF or the World Bank, what is your forecast looking forward to how this gets gets resolved or not for that matter? Um, I, I mean, I think there's a, a serious risk that it, it doesn't get, get resolved in any comprehensive way. Um, I mean, the, the G20 initiative you know, is a standstill for the next six months, from May, the beginning of May till the end of the year. Uh, the IMF has a small uh, debt relief fund for the poorest countries. Um, but it, I, it's, it's not looking very hopeful. Um, and one of the reasons is the worst thing from the creditor's point of view is if debtors act collectively. And most of these initiatives are requiring debt, are calling for debtors to act collectively, um, and that's a problem. I, but I, I mean, I, as this crisis goes on and it gets worse, and the it becomes clear how deep the economic crisis is, one can only hope that um, there's more willingness by everybody to be creative, because ultimately, if the crisis is is as severe as it's beginning to look. Um, then the, the chances of African countries being able to pay their creditors goes down and coming up with ways that can at least over time enhance that seems to, be in, seems to me to be in everybody's interest. I, but I, I agree with you, there's lots of grounds to be skeptical, but I, I'm hopeful that an idea like mine, at, at least if it doesn't succeed on its own, at least stimulates people to think more creatively about how we can deal with this very serious crisis. Indeed, you closed one of your articles recently by saying Africa is facing a profound crisis that could set its development back a generation. So we're not talking even just a few years, but an entire generation, and that really shows what the stakes are. Uh, The two articles, and we're going to have them, are Vultures, Doves, and African Debt, Here's a Way Out, and also Deterring the Debt Vultures in Africa by Danny Bradlow. Uh, professor of International Development Law and African Economic Relations at the University of Pretoria. Uh, Professor Bradlow, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and to stimulate the discussion with these ideas that I think are over uh, overdue. We, we don't have enough of these kind of more hopeful uh, conversations that are going on right now, and so we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. It was great. Kobus, I think I came off sounding a little skeptical when speaking with Danny, in part because I am skeptical. I, I think he's got more optimism in the system. I think he's got more optimism and hope that companies like J.P. Morgan will do, quote unquote, the right thing. I think he's more optimistic that there'll be collaborations between parties that don't normally work together, uh, the Chinese, the Americans, the Europeans, even Africans who don't always work together very well. I mean, this idea of Pan-African unity in terms of coming together on debt is really unprecedented. So we don't know actually if this will work or not, but it just seems like to do this under great circumstances would be really difficult. But now to do it under a gun to the head in the form of a pandemic and again, deteriorating economies by the day. I mean, the erosion is happening minute by minute. The debt is piling up. I read today, for example, that Angola has a $750 million bond payment that it has to make before the end of the year. Now, for a country that sells oil and oil's prices are in the tank, that's a hard thing to do. That's a very, very difficult thing to do. So I am very skeptical that this is going to happen. I have a feeling that what I'm thinking now is that everybody's negotiating separate deals. The Chinese are negotiating one set They're not talking to the IMF. The G20 is doing something different. The private creditors are doing their thing. And there's a a sense of chaos right now. And everything that Danny was talking about was predicated on the idea, and we also heard this from Vera Songwe as well in our discussion with her, that there's some unity in the discussion. And I don't see any evidence of that. That might just be because we're on the outside. We don't see what's happening behind closed doors. So I freely admit that we do not have the best line of sight on all of this. But from what it looks like from... The bleachers is it doesn't look good. 
and you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm speaking very much as a non-expert in this particular issue. It seemed to me that both Danny and Vera's way of of articulating it was, you know, kind of was was to a certain extent based on the idea of some form of institutional constancy. Um, you know that that the that post COVID the the system will the system that we had pre COVID will roughly keep going, um, and that the um, that the kind of trajectory of of moving of the trajectory towards more kind of ethical investment lending you know kind of economic dealings on the international scene that we've seen a, a big push for um, you know through the HIPAA initiative through the work of of people like Jubilee like you know kind of through the the uh, you know other kind of human rights actors also taking on corporations, that kind of thing that we've seen the development of from the 90s through through the, the 20, through 2020, that that would continue post-COVID. Um, at the moment, I think, you know, that that assumption, you know, which I think it's for, for a lot of a lot of researchers is a necessary assumption to, you know, in order to do their work, you know, kind of because otherwise you're in kind of sci-fi territory where you have to like, like try and predict what norms are going to be like, you know, after after this crisis. Um, I, but I, at the same time, that kind of assumption, I think, is a little bit up in the air at the moment, in the sense that. It seems to me at the moment that there is that there is um, a kind of a license has been granted for everyone to act as monstrously as they want, um, you know, kind of, and for that 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 long term thing of of at least having to 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 articulate a, a dedication to to fairness or you know kind of good governance, you know, that might fly out the window. Now th this that might only be you know, kind of for the next few months, or it might be for the rest of this decade, you know, kind of like, like, wh where, where our kind of standards are going to land, you know, kind of post this crisis is so difficult to say. And I think so much of ri is, is riding on that on that question. Yeah, but this idea of having faith in institutions, when one of the defining trends of the 21st century has been the erosion of institutional credibility, and this started long before the Trump administration, where the WTO has not been able to come up with an agreement. The WTO has more or less been marginalized now in favor of regional economic agreements and bilateral agreements. Now the World Health Organization's had a torpedo shot across its bow or landed right into it. Uh, the United States has been actively, uh, you know, chipping away at the United Nations for it. What, what are these institutions that are going to do something? And in particular, we cannot avoid the fact that the Trump administration and the United States as a culture oftentimes does not trust these institutions and any hint that these institutions would impinge on U.S. sovereignty will then get a pushback immediately. So this sounds like, and I said this earlier, the voice of weak countries that depend on these institutions because that's their way to ex exercise power and strong countries who don't like these institutions will go their own way. And so it, 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 that just that's a trend that's been in, underway for 20 years now, not just something recent. I think COVID, as you've pointed out, is expediting things. It's putting jet fuel into things like that. But relying, and so it's not surprising that Vera Songwe at the UN would think that the UN is a central player in all of this. But I don't think you're going to find a lot of people in Washington who are going to support the idea of the UN playing a central role. Well, again, you know, kind of it depends, like, are we playing Trump rules into next year and beyond? Or, or is it going to be a different US administration? Because, you know, kind of, I agree with you that there's been a trend in, in degrading these institutions for a long time. But the way that they are, the way that that, that these rich and strong countries exercise their, their power within them differs according to the, the different, there are different approaches, right? Kind of so, so the Obama administration were also, you know, kind of like trying to sway these institutions, but it happened within a frame work where there was a lot of of a lot of the objects of working together right um and I, and I assume that if if it's a biden presidency next year then there would be some return to at least the you know kind of the language of international cooperation whereas with the trumps you know they 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 gather a lot of of political energy from the objects of not cooperating um you know so so those are two you know even even if one assumes that the u.s is gonna is gonna pursue like hard self-interest in in the system there are different ways of of, of pursuing that and and as far as I, the, in the way that i understood um danny and, and but more specifically also vera's discussion of it is that they that they can factor that in right kind of that that approach of like of 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 
you know, looking for hard self-interest within these organizations, th they can work with that. Um, well, you know, kind of if if it happens, if it we see a continuation into the 2020s of a very hard anti-institution kind of way, it bias the way that that we saw from the Trump administration. Then I think I agree with you. Then it starts kind of dealing with the, the institutions. It all starts becoming you know, pointless, um, you know, kind of if, if it's a, you know, if, if it's a, a situation where where uh, the U.S. is trying to use this this, uh, this um, institution to, to push its interests, but that leads to still the institution functioning in some kind of way, then it's a different issue. Regardless if it's a Trump administration or a Biden administration, what we do know for certain is that in 2021, you're going to see United States that is politically divided that will still be struggling with COVID, that will have uh, economic conditions on par with a depression. Uh, situation in Europe will probably be not that much better. So these powers that normally are the ballasts for these institutions will be preoccupied with their own domestic instability. And again, I have a feeling that Africa is going to be priority number 637 on their list. And that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen even this Hundred billion dollars, which is now sofa change in the in the types of economic relief packages we've been seeing around the world, and they haven't been able to get that done. So that should give everybody a lot of pause as to how much can actually be done, because the political will, and Charlie Robertson said this last week, the political will to do something is not evident right now. And my guess is that's not going to get better as the economic situation and even now the political situation in a place like the U.S. deteriorates. That's just my uh, my two cents on it. Final thoughts to you, Cobus, before we go. The, there's one card that Africa has to play, which could swing political world very quickly. In I Europe. know what you're going to say. I know where you're going with this one, which is people's feet. Exactly. It's like, you know, kind of like, it's, it's the, old, the old Fidel Castro trick, right? Kind of like send millions of little boats. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's the thing of like, you know, that kind of thing of like, oh, you know, now that we're so overwhelmed and so, so kind of we're facing such hardships due to this pandemic, it might be impossible for us to enforce any kind of control of, of um, illegal immigration to Europe. You know, yeah, that's what I said in today's newsletter. Yeah, I was writing, I was writing about that very point in today's newsletter. And there is a point to be made about the protests in the U.S. that African Americans are getting some results again in the form of increased charges against the four officers, only because they have protested so violently and so aggressively and so loudly. And one might think that the current African leadership approach to debt relief is very subdued, diplomatic, and quiet and that they may actually want to start turning up the volume with threats like what you've been talking about and allusions and references to political instability to say, if you don't help us with this problem, this will become your problem. And that is what Europe wants to avoid. Yeah, I think, I think if, if that becomes a calculus, then Brussels will be able to find the money probably in half an hour. Oh, I have a feeling, yes, the Germans are very keen on that, <laughs> very keen on that. So uh, that'll do it for this edition. Uh, today, again, we didn't talk a lot about China, and we do that from time to time in order to provide the broader context around the China-Africa discussion, because after all, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. So this is one part of the debt relief picture that African governments are wrestling with. The Chinese part is another one. Uh, sometimes they overlap, and in some cases they don't. But it's important that we all have the bigger context to what's going on. Now, uh, Danny, he didn't like what we said when we were speaking with Charlie Robertson, and he emailed us and said, hey, I didn't like it. Uh, you didn't talk about vulture funds. You didn't talk about that. And what did we do? We invited Danny on to the next week to come and share his point of view. So we'd love to hear from you. And if you have a really good point about what you don't like about what we're doing, we really want to bring all of these opinions to the discussion. Uh, so that is our objective here. That's what we do in our newsletter, where basically what we're doing in the newsletter, and I write it every day, is I'm trying to capture the conversations every day from all these different pe people and, and these different ideas, like Danny's. And so by putting that all together, you as the listener, you as the reader can then make up your mind about how all this information fits together. So that's what we're doing on the podcast. It's what we're doing in the newsletter. We would love to have you join our community of readers that is steadily growing. We're very excited about that all over the world following this very dynamic China-Africa discussion. It's half off for students and teachers uh, because we know students and teachers are all poor, right, Kovas? 
And so we really want to make it accessible to everybody. Uh, so go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe and you can sign up there. So that'll do it for this edition. Cobus and I will be back again next week with another installment of the China in Africa podcast. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to Facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter where you can find Gwobas at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.